Welcome to Sideline Sanity with me, Michelle Tafoya, sponsored by Legacy Precious Metals. There has never been a better time to invest in precious metals. Go to LegacyPMInvestments.com, LegacyPMInvestments.com. Find out what investing in gold and silver can do for you, not only in the short term, but really as a long-term play. And our thanks to Legacy Precious Metals for their devoted support of this show. Coming up, Tal Tasfani is the CEO of the Ayn Rand organization, or the Ayn Rand Institute, I should say, which maybe some of you have read Ayn Rand. Her name is spelled A-Y-N and R-A-N-D. She wrote The Fountainhead. She wrote Atlas Shrug. That is her classic, which is assigned to many people in high school or college, Atlas Shrugged. And then there's We the Living. And I read that one first. And these books really changed my perspective on the world. She operates around a philosophy. She's not only a novelist, but she operates around a philosophy called objectivism. And it's fascinating. And it's very pro-capitalism. And she might be one of the greatest supporters of America ever. And she was born during the Russian Revolution and communism and all of that. She's an amazing person and her legacy lives on. And to talk about it is Tal Tasfani who came from Israel, has an amazing background, and now runs the Ayn Rand Institute. He's an interesting guy. This is a fascinating topic. We'll get into it next. For nearly three decades, she's reported the action from the sidelines. She started very young. She's covered the NBA, NFL, Olympics, and the college football and basketball national championships. And now, during these insane times in our world, Michelle Tafoya thinks we need a serious dose of sanity. This is Sideline Sanity with your host, one of the sanest people on planet Earth, Michelle Tafoya. Tal Tasvani is the CEO, as I've mentioned before, of the Ayn Rand Institute. It's very good to speak to you. You and I have never met before, but you found out that I was a fan of Ayn Rand, and I'm not sure how you found that out. How did you learn that? We have our intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little scary, yeah. but kind of cool. Yeah. I read first We the Living, and wow. it impacted really? me. It, it impacted me a great deal. I, I, I decided I kind of wanted to go in order when I decided to dive into the Ayn Rand works. And this book was powerful to me, and it really, I think if Americans read this book, they would appreciate what we have so much more. But as well as being a novelist, Ayn was a, um, a philosopher, and her philosophy was objectivism. Tal, how do you explain what that is to people? Objectivism uh, studies the relationship between consciousness and reality, and uh, Ayn, Ayn Rand uh, define three ways you can go about uh, interacting with reality as a human being. One is by revelations, uh, what you call intrinsicism, which means that the truth is in reality and it needs to be revealed to us through means of revelation. The other one is subjectivism, which means my mind decides, you know, whatever I feel is what reality is. And she says both are wrong. And let's define an objective way to deal with reality. And uh, through reason, uh, the connection between a consciousness and reality needs to be by the power of our ability to perceive it by our senses and percepts, and then make sure that our concepts are objective, objectively describing reality as it is. I think it's a, the most advanced philosophy we have as, in, you know, as, as a race, as a human race. Uh, she's just not well known. You know, philosophy takes ages and ages to yeah. penetrate into the, into, uh, um, into the culture. And I think if you really understand the meta philosophers, if you think about, I think about four, there's Plato, Aristotle, and Plato is the father of, you know, with his hand up in the famous Raphael school of Athens, with his hand up saying, yeah, it's all about revelations and the world of forms. Aristotle with his hand down saying, no, it's about reality. Uh, it's about reason. And he invented logic and, and everything that we see around us. Technology is all about Aristotle. And then, uh, and then you got Kant, which is the philosophy we're living right now. I can explain that later on. He's okay. a Platonist, but he's bringing back Plato. And I think Rand is the most advanced Aristotelian 
we just have to realize that uh, she is explaining a lot of things around us. And hopefully one day we'll live her philosophy and not what we're living right now. Well, you talked about what we're living right now. Yes. How do you describe what we're living right now? I mean, when I look at the world, there's a lot, there's a lot of complexity. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of rage. There's a lot of me, me, me. Um, but then there are uh, definitely those who are, are very faithful, deep in their religion, who believe in a higher power. Is there really only one way that we're living right now? Um, I would say, yeah, if you think about, I, I can give you world history in a minute. It's so, such uh, that you'll understand how wide my perspective is. You, you oh, think good. about ancient Greece and the really the discovery of philosophy. And you got Plato and Aristotle and Aristotle uh, being on the rise. And then in Rome, Plato is coming back. And then we go into the Dark Ages where uh, it, Platonism and Christianity, as far as I'm concerned, are kind of joined together. And then Thomas Aquinas brings back Aristotle in the you know 1200s and sparks uh, the Renaissance, sparks the Enlightenment, the Age of Reason. He's bringing back Aristotle. And then you, you got the scientific revolution of Newton. You got the political revolution of America. And then you got the Industrial Revolution of America. But at the same year that America is born, Kant says, oh, my God, uh, reason is going to kill faith. What do we do about it? So he brings back Plato, but adds, <clears throat> put it, puts him on steroids. And he basically says, the world doesn't exist, really. It's all in your mind. So there's nothing to really reason with. And he creates what Ayn Rand calls subjectivism, which you know, um, evolved into this, uh, we can we can believe whatever you want. And then you, you got collectivism uh, with Hegel that led to, you know, communism and Nazi Germany, and um, which is we can decide whatever you want as far as morality. What we're living right now is an evolution of all of that into a deep subjectivism. Maybe, you know, if you think about woke, what, it, what is it mm. when you say you can decide to be a man, I can decide to be a woman, every, anything goes. At the deep, deep end of it, it's uh, you define a relationship between consciousness and reality to say, no, consciousness comes be before reality, whatever I decide. So this is my widest perspective of um, seeing, you know, how the world really starts with philosophy and then ends up with politics. And uh, I, I see it like as a huge iceberg where we are all living at the top of it. And it's like you know, winds are lashing from sides to sides, but really somebody's holding it at the bottom of the iceberg and moving us to another ocean. And we're shifting um, from the age of reason into the age of subjectivism. And that's scary. It is scary. And why do you think it's happening? Why do you think it evolved in this direction and so strongly in this direction? I mean, you talked about people believing they can be one thing or another. I mean, we've got kids believing they're, they're puppies and kittens and, you know, and being encouraged to do so and, af, you know, getting the affirmation, which is this buzzword, to, to be that which they decide they want to be. How do we get here? We get here from philosophy. Uh, everyone, when you wake up in the morning, you're running on a philosophy. It's your operating system. I'm an engineer, right. so I like to think in, in terms of uh, <laughs> machines. And so, but honestly, we're all, what we're trying to do, you and I and any, anyone else, is to express our ideas, express our morality in reality. You're here interviewing me because that's something you love. It's your productive work. You think it's good. There's, there's you know, you're contributing something to yourself and to the, and, you know, to your environment by doing this. So you're waking up every day and you're living ideas. And where those, do those ideas come from? Where did you decide that being productive is good? When did someone decide to, I don't know, in Saudi Arabia that uh, stoning women to death is, is, is a good thing? They're living a morality. Now, morality sits on two things, which is metaphysics and epistemology. Metaphysics is what do we think about reality, the nature of reality? And epistemology is how do we know reality? Those are the fundamental now, everybody, without even knowing how to spell metaphysics and, and mm -hmm. epistemology, is actually living it because their ethics, um, their morality is based on, the, on those core ideas. Now, if you come from a specific religion or a specific culture, if you call yourself a, a Christian or a Jew or um, a woke, um, Black Lives Matter, it doesn't matter. You are 
basing your worldview on a philosophy, even though it's implicit, you don't know how to verbalize it. So, you know, when people talk about politics all day long, I see it from afar and I say, it doesn't really matter. What really matters uh, is the ups and downs of philosophy. Are we living in Aristotelian world where it's reason and uh, uh, in a way aligning with humans, human um, nature and the way it relates to reality or are we going against it? Uh, and that will decide, that will determine, are we going up in uh, quality of life, in um, prosperity, or are we going down? And Honestly, the way I see history now is we're going down with Kant launching an attack on reason, the attack of the age of reason, and we're living it. And so, um, by the way, the way I see it, it's not right and left. I think the right and left are both on the same side of irrationality. And mm -hmm. I think what we need to do is to understand that there is another side of rationality, of objectivity. And um, I always say, you know, what is two and two? If I two and two plus two is four, why? How did you decide it's four? Is it objective? Yes. So in math and science, you say, oh, it's objective. And if you say five, you're wrong. Right. What about philosophy? <laughs> why is it anything goes? Whatever you decide is true is true. No, I think the reason why I love Rand's view of the world is that she's trying to apply a scientific approach to the most important field of human life, which is philosophy. And say, look, uh, if you follow reason, you can see that two and two is four. Capitalism works because it has to work because it aligns to human nature and the way we conceptualize the world, the world and how we express ourselves. It's not a matter of opinion, it's science. It's, so she's yeah, this is what's so in yeah, yeah. The, the whole the whole notion of science and math is so interesting to me. I want to dive deeper into that when we come back, because we've been through a stretch here lately where you are either called a science denier mm -hmm. or, you know, a science acceptor, almost science as religion. And that part is very troubling to me uh, when when math is so clear cut but science continues to evolve as we evolve. It's it's deep, but it's not because it has so many relevant tentacles in today's life. More with Tal Tisfani right after this. Well, these days, <laughs> money. Money is a big topic of conversation at every kitchen table. The economy is so, it's just unpredictable. And it's a little scary, frankly. But silver and gold can be a great way to round out your portfolio. They give you things that the stock market just can't give. They give you protection against a weakening dollar. They provide a hedge against inflation. Those are things the stock market just can't do. And when it comes to precious metals, um, I trust Legacy Precious Metals. They have been a sponsor of this show from the very beginning. And I trust them because they're honest. They're educators. They want to tell you how this long-term play can really help you. You've got your short-term stuff for sure, but you've got long-term stuff. You've got to think about your retirements. These days remind me a lot of 2008. And if you recall, back then it was, you know, up and down and all around the economy. But those who invested in gold saw significant gains. And those who didn't, well, many people lost their retirements. So now is a good time to get in touch with Legacy Precious Metals and see how they can help you for your long-term play. This is the way to look at your future. So there are a couple ways to get a hold of them. You can speak to an IRA expert at Legacy Precious Metals at 866-528-1903, 866-528-1903. You can also download their free investor's guide at LegacyPMInvestments.com, LegacyPMInvestments.com. Don't let another day go. Give them a shout. Okay, you mentioned math and science, and these are big in objectivism, the Ayn Rand philosophy. And you talked about capitalism, and it has to work because it's based on reason. Mm -hmm. So lately, it seems to me that there's this strange intertwining of capitalism and science. In other words, we're going to make a vaccine, we're going to tell you it's good for you, and we're going to make a ton of money in the process, and your life's going to be better, but it wasn't necessarily better. It's it's a really weird time to be looking at science in the, in the world. How would how would objectivism respond to, to what we've seen in the last couple of years? Well, um, first, we have to define our terms. 
right? When I say capitalism, I mean that social system that is all about protecting individual rights. That is the discovery of the founding, well, actually the philosophers before the founding fathers and then the founding fathers applying it. What it actually, capitalism is, is a system where we all acknowledge and we sign a contract saying you have your in, inalienable uh, individual right for your life, liberty, and your property, and I respect that. And we create a monopoly on force called the government that says you don't hurt, hurt each other. And so you have the police, the, the army, right, for, for external, Yep. And then you got the judicial system that is applying objective law to protect our individual rights. It says nothing about the intervention of government with economy. It just says nothing about the intervention. It's, it's a complete separation of the government from right. ethics. It's you're, you just sitting in the edge of the island. And whenever we hurt, start hurting each other, you come reactively and make sure that we don't hurt each other. That is capitalism. And whenever it was tried just a little bit, uh, and I think, the, of course, the most wonderful century of capitalism was the 19th century in, in America, when there was no public roads and public schools and public welfare and public, public anything. And we went from, you know, uh, huts to skyscrapers in, in decades. Right. And do you think we have innovation today? Well, think about what it was to live in 1860 or 1870 when there's, oh, now there's metal and now there's engines and now there's flight and, you know, and we have another version of the iPhone. Um, so. Capitalism for me is that system that protects individual rights and it has to work because it allows, it gives humans the prerequisite they need to express their humanity, which is freedom. I cannot be a, a human and express my concepts into a product without the freedom to do so. Now, I wanna say something about what, what you said with science. So this is capitalism, it's not crony capitalism, it's not the, uh, you know, pharmaceuticals um, colluding together with the government to get, um, you know, um, some kind of favors or, or just coercion force. Uh, this is not capitalism. And by the way, when people say crony capitalism, I think that's, that's it's two different things. You cannot be crony if there's capitalism because the government doesn't have anything to be to give you um, economically. So that's, that's one thing. The other thing is that I think um, people who claim to bring science to the table are not really scientists. Um, the science of matter is one thing, and the science of the mind and cognition is a completely different thing. And people are trying to mix them together. And in this case, um, there's a lot to be said. We only have, you know, 30 minutes. But, uh, <laughs> I can tell you that a lot of people that are claiming to speak for science are not scientists. They have their premises, the philosophical premises, are uh, completely irrational, and I don't trust the word they're saying. Who would Ayn Rand trust today? Um, the honest businessmen, the people who make uh, what they do honestly. If you think about, you know, people we all know, uh, uh, Steve Jobs, Jeff Bezos, she would she would name streets after them. She would elevate them as heroes. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, the cultural, you know, if you think about artists and so on, but uh, the men of the mind who apply themselves in a, in, the, in a genius level way to give us all the products and the prosperity. And we need to say thank you. If you know anything about Atlas Shrugged, it's yeah. really a celebration of the productive mind, of, re of reason, and from there on, the productive mind. Because what we do as humans, our means of survival, is our mind, you know, where, you know, bear can kill me if <laughs> it's stronger than me, a lion can out, out race me and so on. But it's, uh, it's my mind, it's my reasoning mind. And all we need as humans is the freedom to express it and then build uh, the vision uh, or build the world in the power of our vision. That's what we do as human beings. And the more freedom you give us, the more pros prosper we will be and the more, uh, coercive you will be and uh, limiting our freedoms and our ability to think. Um, this is where we, you know, see all the problems that we have right now in the world. Yeah. yeah, And I do think we have them right now. You mentioned two Steve Jobs and you mentioned um, 
the the Amazon guy. Sorry, just Jeff my Bezos, yes. thank you, Jeff Bezos. <laughs> you didn't mention Elon Musk. Would would I approve of Elon Musk? No, I think Elon Musk is a mixed bag. I love Elon from a from a, an engineering genius perspective. I'm a genius. I can appreciate how smart he is in building things, and he always talks about uh, first. First, first principles. So he applies first principles when he's building a rocket. He says, no, no, you know what? I'll think in first principles and I'll show you I can build a rocket in like one hundredth of the cost that it costs to build it in NASA or in Russia. He doesn't have philosophical first principles. He, t- he starts from a, a specific axioms and then builds a worldview on top of it. And some of those so-called axioms are wrong. This is why he's a mixed bag. He says great things and trying to push us in the right direction and say, then says something that completely contradicts it. Um, yeah, I invite Elon to uh, get a lesson in objectivism and maybe uh, try to uh, really go below his uh, philosophical first principles. Well, you, you used a term first principles. Yes. What, is, what does that mean exactly? It means, uh, let's say that I don't believe any, anyone on anything. I want to see things as they are. So the axiom is like the world exists, right? In order for you to try to prove me that the world doesn't exist, you have to exist. So that's an axiom. In okay. order to contradict it, you have to to show that it's true. So it has to be true. Um, so um, in, in physics, there are some, some first principles that he's using that really work for him in the way he thinks. In philosophy, it's very hard to figure it out. Ayn Rand, uh, you know, sees three axioms where... The, the whole human knowledge is based on that human that that a, a sorry uh, the existence exists it's right here and you cannot not exist um, and then that we have the law of identity what she calls a is a this iPhone has to be an iPhone it's not something else and if you don't really see that it's an iPhone and then um, that in order for something to exist it has to be something those are like the first principles of knowledge. Okay. And if somebody comes to you and says, oh, I don't know that you're really here. We're not really talking here. Then walk away because what is there to talk about, right? <laughs> so those are th- uh, philosophical first principles. Okay. This is so interesting. I- again, I read The Fountainhead. First I read We the Living, then The Fountainhead, then Atlas Shrugged. And they all made an impact on me. And my philosophy, I think, is 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 varied a little bit because... While I agree with objectivism, um, there's a lot that I have taken from Stoicism as well. And I'm a big fan of Stoicism. So after this next break here, I want to talk to you about how those two might coexist or can they? We'll get to the first principles of that right after this. Well, you may not be able to see Jersey, my dog. He often makes himself heard during the podcast, but you know how much I love this little 10-month-old pup that's come into our lives. And Recently, I started giving him supplements, um, and I've already started to see results, and it's kind of incredible. Why did I choose to supplement my pet's diet? Okay, well, you've got human food, right? And just like human food, dog food strips a lot of the nutrients out of whole foods. They strip it of vitamins, minerals, all the nutrients your dog needs. Some of that comes out of the dog food, and the dog food just isn't enough. Now, I know you want to avoid that. So I'm going to tell you about the longevity formula from Paw Made, and that's Paw, P-A-W, Made. It's an all-natural health supplement for dogs made with 23 dog-friendly superfoods to keep your dog healthy and strong. Veterinarian-approved longevity formula boosts nutrient intake, it protects against toxins, and guards against premature aging. Hmm, that sounds pretty good to me. Uh, and that's important because aside from poor diet, toxins like pesticides, mold, and air pollution, well, those can harm your dog's health, just like they can harm a human's health. But longevity formula contains special toxin-fighting nutrients to protect your dog so they can live a long, happy life by your side. Now, these include premium quality superfoods like organic mushrooms, kelp, goji berry, two kinds of probiotics, and many more things that'll help your pup. And right now, listen to this, a limited time offer exclusively for our listeners and viewers. For every purchase of Longevity Formula, you'll receive a free bottle of Pomade's hip and joint formula too. And you know how the hips and the joints of these dogs can take a beating. Now to claim your offer, go to pawmade.com 
slash sideline. That's P-A-W-M-A-D-E.com slash sideline or call toll free 833-PAW-MADE, M-A-D-E. Again, that's pawmade.com, P-A-W-M-A-D-E.com slash sideline or call 833-PAW-MADE. You'll be glad you did. Okay, I love stoicism. It has given me great guideposts in my life and it's based on you know, justice and courage and wisdom and temperance. And so it's, it's a little bit of a, a, a different approach, I think, from objectivism. Yeah. Can the two coexist within one person's philosophical worldview? There are, there's a lot of great stuff in Stoicism. I have to, you know, to uh, say I'm not an expert. And uh, by the way, one of, of the faculty members here in the Ayn Rand Institute is a, a, an expert on Stoicism and the relationship between Stoicism and objectivism. And you, you I, I'm sure he'll be happy to. Uh, we'll uh, have to have him yeah. on the show next. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I would say, look, uh, a lot of the, you know, what all of the Stoic, uh, Stoic philosophers are trying to say is is very aligned. Uh, I mean, from a virtue perspective, uh, and how does a, um, a human need to apply themselves with the, the right virtues that are coming from the ultimate virtue, which is being rational, Appl using your mind in the way, the only way that it can really understand, integrate reality, and then act according to it. I would say the only thing that I've, when I, the little that I've read is that Stoicism has this sense of duty, like you have to yes. do something. And I don't believe in duty. Uh, I believed in duty till I was 39. And I was, I grew up in Israel and uh, I was growing up in a very conservative in, environment where they said, you have to serve God, you have to do this, you have to put the kippah on and so on. I rejected that. And then they, at at the age of nine, I moved to an Israeli kibbutz. I don't know if you know what it is. It's a commune. Uh, the Russian immigrants to Israel created a commune. And I was, um, people don't understand that, but I was not the property of my parents anymore. I was the property of the kibbutz. And when I got a tape recorder for by mar, bar mitzvah, they wouldn't let me keep it because everybody has to be equal. So I rejected that as well. That's on, on the left. You have to serve the common good. And I lived that life until I read Atlas Shrugged. And in Atlas Shrugged, what I took is like, wait a second, I can live independently the, with the power of my reason. I don't have to anything because where is the have to come, come from? So the only, uh, and again, I think you'll, you better be better serve talking to Aaron about this, but um, there's no have to. The only have to needs to come from, from me realizing that being honest and being just and being courageous and being principles are principled are all uh, guides, uh, moral guides to say, if you follow this because of your nature and the nature of reality and the combination of those two, you will succeed. And so Ayn Rand, um, not like all the other philosophers, derives all of her morality out of reason and reality and the nature of human being. So I think it's the most advanced because I can answer any why that you'd ask me about the objectivist morality. Uh, when I asked why is in, uh, with other philosophies, it's like, because that's what we believe. It worked for us, or um, that's what God said so, or that's what's good good for the common good. So you have to, you know, sacrifice for other people. Right. And I, uh, since I was born, I, I can't stop asking why. Can you explain that to me? And Ayn Rand gives me the why and the answers to, this, to those uh, philosophical questions. That's fascinating. Um, and it's that's a really good point, because it, duty does suggest that you're serving someone other than yourself. But, you know, like you said, we do we, we require a military, right, mm -hmm. to protect us from outside forces. And they do a duty, a service. So how, how can you have that <laughs> duty as being acceptable within objectivism? I don't believe it's a duty. I mean, in Israel, you have to go to the army. In the United States, you don't have to go to the army. And the beautiful thing about humans is that we all value different things. So some people love the job of protecting the freedom of their nation. So, so they would go there and sacrifice. I don't think it's a sacrifice. It's a win-win. I mean, the soldier that chose to be a soldier and carry a gun and protect our nation is doing what he wants to do, right? What he believes is good for him. 
That's his, you know, that's his central purpose in life. He loves gun, guns and he loves the idea of protection. Some of them become generals and take it as a, as a career. Um, there's no coercion in it, right? And if you loved being, you know, being an anchor and interviewing people and diving and bringing great content to people, that's what you do. This beautiful thing about humans and free will is that we all value different things. So I don't believe in duty. I mean, I remember asking one of the objectivist philosophers when I was just starting, because I was coming you know, from an Israeli perspective, it's like, wait a second, but if we don't force people to protect themselves, there will be no country. And he said to me, a country that coerces its own citizens to protect itself is not worth protecting. I was like, wow, that's an interesting way to look at it. And, and that's what really is happening. I mean, America is just an amazing place where freedom comes before everything. And the Constitution is the most wonderful, you know, the, and uh, Declaration of Independence, my hero, Jefferson. Um, it's just a, an, it's a conceptual achievement. It's the realization of how to apply the right morality in the social context, which means we just decide to recognize that we all have rights. Uh, rights do not exist in reality. It's a concept. And uh, that's what's going to make all of this work. And Ayn Rand said um, <laughs> that no philosopher could have seen the power of the human mind if they were born before the Industrial Revolution. And I agree with her. I mean, just seeing the, the power of the mind to harness the uh, this world and, you know, fly us in the air and... Hmm you know, have you and I talk over a computer. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, she's she just, I, I think it's it's a philosophy for life and it's a philosophy for love, I think. It's a, the love of, of humanity as it is. Um, yeah, so. Uh, Interesting. I don't, I don't believe in duty because we have free will and you cannot be a human if you're coerced. And by the way, this is great parental advice. Let your... <laughs> Let your let your child be your child. You know, don't hover over them and tell them what not to do. Don't beat the the love of life out of them because they're human beings. They're trying to explore the world and and um, really build the world in the image of their own mind. That's, that's but you can't it. let them run into the street when a car is coming. That's true. I didn't say <laughs> whimsically uh, do that, but allow them to explore the world. Give them a buffet yeah. of option. You know. We put them in, in classrooms with everybody else and tell them, oh, you're not different than anyone else. We don't really care what you love. We're going to teach you what we think is important. Yeah. That's not the way to raise a human. No. So. I, that's another reason I believe in school choice. I believe that everyone should be, be able to choose how their child is educated and, and in what way. Uh, last thing before I let you go, how long have you been in America now? I moved from Israel in 2006. And okay. And a citizen as fast as I could because this... This place just rocked my world, and uh, <laughs> really, I, I started with learning a his, a American history, and then uh, a, a, um, a friend of mine gave me Atlas Shrugged, and it just opened. She didn't open a window; she blew up the walls for me. I mean, oh goodness, she really yeah. uh, had me reconsider all of my moral premises, and uh, even below that, you know, metaphysical. Well, in the time you've been here from 2006, because I agree with you, this is a phenomenal country based on an, an idea that is to me so simple and beautiful and right. In the time that you've been here, have you seen it decline? Have you seen it trip itself up a little bit? You know, you've got a lot of Americans who believe in socialism, who believe that we should be a socialist nation, who believe that you know, everyone is, is the same or everyone should be the same and treated the same and no matter what they do or how. And so I wonder from your perspective, which is quite unique, um, if you've seen anything that concerns you about America. I'll give you the, uh, the local and then the, uh, the more uh, abst abstract uh, answer. Okay. The, the local one is I live in Alpharetta, Georgia. And ah. when I came in 2006, everybody was smiling at you and uh, wishing you, uh, you know, have, to have a great day. And it was amazing. I remember one time I was in a, in a stoplight and I, I was distracted. I didn't see it turned uh, green. And then a couple of seconds later, I, 
I said in Israel, they would not just honk, they would come out of the car and bang your ear on the roof <laughs> for you to go. And that's the beauty of the, of, uh, you know, the freedom of uh, the social context of America is, is we respect each other. You are an opportunity for me if you're walking, if I see someone in the street, because we don't coerce each other. And uh, in other social places, people don't understand that you're any, everyone is a risk. Everyone is, uh, is, a, is a danger because you're fighting for the same things and who's going to get more money out of the government and, and so on. So this is, creates this animosity. From a, a very wide perspective, I can tell you that, yes, America is became, be, becoming Europe. Um, German philosophers mainly uh, infiltrated uh, our system in the late 19th century and took over the educational system without noticing. We were busy doing other things. They took over the philosophy departments. And if you go to any philosophy department, unfortunately, this is why we created the Ayn Rand University um, to fight that, is your uh, politicians and your judges and anyone was, was um, educated on a collectivist philosophy, on a, a, what we call a subjective philosophy. So at the, at the core, we're corrupting uh, the foundation that America is standing on because uh, the founding fathers were educated in the enlightenment ideas of the age of reason. Now our judges and politicians and anyone, our journalists are educated on the uh, foundation of uh, Immanuel Kant, who really created uh, the subjectivist philosophy and the fact that uh, reason is futile. So if it's not the age of reason, it's the age of anti-reason. And then in politics, you will see a lot of anti-reason. And as I said, I reject both the right and the left. They're both collectivist in a way. One wants to uh, put their hand in your wallet and the other one wants to tell you what to do in your bedroom. And they're both wrong. I mean, um, and you know, this is why a lot of people think that Ayn Rand is a libertarian, by the way. She is not. She thinks the libertarians uh, do not have a ethical foundation. They, they believe in all kinds of the axiom of non-aggression. She doesn't ex accept. So Ayn Rand is like here waiting for us, uh, for, to, for, for everyone to discover her, to say she gives you the answers uh, on how to build a wonderful, prosperous. And she's the only one that I think really protects um, and uh, explains the morality of capitalism and, and America. She's the best defender of America. That's, so, that's yeah. fascinating. And that's a good reason for people to read her stuff. And, and, you know, look, you can go to the website. There's so much to learn. It's AynRand.org, A-Y-N-R-A-N-D.org. There was a little tease on the website. So people think, because her she was not born Ayn Rand. She changed yeah. her name. And yeah. many people thought it changed to Rand because of her typewriter. That's not true? No, it's not true. Do we, do we know yet why she changed yeah. to Rand? She had, so you know, she, she just loved this, the way uh, names sound. I think it was based on some kind of, uh, um, I don't know if it was Norwegian or something like hero that was named uh, that, that, and she took it. And she just made the, the um, a, you know, a name that she would love to, you know, projected this heroic uh, view of life that she had. And this is what, uh, and, and her life, by the way, if anyone wants to get interested in our archives, um, it's, it's a fascinating uh, human story of, yeah. uh, uh, you know, a girl living, living the, the, you know, the, the revolution in, in Russia and then escaping and building a life uh, for herself in her, in America and then discovering, um, not discovering, but explaining to America what America is all about from a different perspective. But, uh, yeah, yeah it's a heroic life that she lived. She is a remarkable story. Again, I, I recommend people go to the website and discover a lot of things. Einran.org. Tal Tasfani is the CEO. We're so glad you took time to join us today. Thank you so much. And we're going to, we're going to delve into some of your other resources because I do find this a, a fascinating uh, topic. And I think that that intersection of stoicism and objectivism would be really interesting to, to dive deeper into. So we'll do that. Thank you so much, Tal. Thanks, Michelle. This has been Sideline Sanity, everyone. Thanks for listening. Don't forget, be brave and do good. <laughs>